Welcome back to Logic, Language and Information. In today's lesson, we'll examine the different representations of combinational digital systems. Functional descriptions, truth tables, logic formulas, and logic circuit diagrams. And how we go about transforming one representation into another. In lesson 3.1, we briefly discussed the key classes of jobs done by combinational digital systems. We'll draw from these in all our examples, practice exercises and assessment questions for the digital systems application section of the course. Our first example is a very common digital system that we encounter every time we press a button on the keypad of our mobile phone. A BCD or binary coded decimal encoder has the job of outputting the 4-bit binary code for a decimal digit I between 0 and 9, when input I is the only active input. This corresponds to cleanly pushing the button for the decimal digit I. For example, if input P6 is the only one active, meaning keypad button 6 is cleanly pressed, then the output M will be 0110 as the 4-bit binary translation of 6, and the error output R will be 0. If 0 or 2 or more <laughs> inputs are active, then output M must be 0000, 0, 0, 0 and R is 1. The block structure for this system shows the 10 inputs for the decimal digits, the 4-bit binary output M, and the 1-bit error output R. Since the BCD encoder system has 10 inputs, a full truth table for the system has 2 to the power 10 equals 1024 rows. However, the output is only non-error with r equals 0 for only 10 out of 1024 of those rows, namely the ones shaded in grey, that correspond to exactly 1 out of 10 of the decimal digit inputs, pi being active. In those 10 rows, the 4-bit output M is the 4-bit binary code of the decimal number I, for I ranging from 0 to 9. In the other 1,014 rows of the table, the error output R is 1, and the 4-bit output M is 0, 0, 0, 0. There is row 0 at the top, where all of P0, P1 up to P9 are 0, which corresponds to none of the 10 keypad buttons being pressed. And then there are the other 1,013 rows of the table in which two or more of the PI inputs are 1, which correspond to two or more of the 10 keypad buttons being pressed simultaneously. We've indicated some of these error cases in the last two rows using a capital X as a don't care symbol, meaning it can be either 0 or 1, it doesn't matter. The output is the same either way. Using the don't care notation, the second last row actually covers 256 cases where both P0 and P1 are active, while the last row covers all the 256 cases where both P0 and P2 are active. And of course, there is overlap, such as all those cases where all three of P0, P1 and P2 are active. We can similarly describe all the other combinations of two or more out of 10 of the PI act inputs being active. In the BCD encoder system, it is clear that the output depends crucially on certain combinations of input values, namely those that describe when exactly one out of 10 of the decimal digits PI, digit inputs PI are active, which corresponds to exactly one out of 10 of the keypad buttons being cleanly pressed. So let's introduce some intermediate signals, S0, S1, S2, S3 up to S9, which will be the outputs of 10 input AND gates. 
Signal S0 is given by the conjunction of P0 with not P1, not P2 and continuing up to not P9 so that S0 is 1 exactly when P0 is the one and only decimal input active. Likewise, S1 is 1 exactly when P1 is the one and only of the 10 inputs active. S2 is 1 exactly when P2 is the one and only of the 10 inputs active and so on up to S9. Equipped with these intermediate signals, S0, S1 up to S9, we can set about determining a logic formula to characterise each of the four output bits, M3, M2, M1 and M0. Start with the highest order bit, M3. We want to characterise when M3 is true, when it has value 1. Looking at the table down the column for M3, we can see that M3 is 1 exactly when combination S8 is true or, com meaning co or combination S9 is true, meaning keypad buttons 8 or 9 have been cleanly pressed. So we can conclude that M3, if and only if, S8 or S9. In a circuit for the system, M3 is the output of a two-input OR gate with the inputs S8 and S9 which are in turn the outputs of 10 input AND gates. Next, the second highest order bit, M2. Here, again from the table, we see that M2 is 1, exactly when one of the keypad buttons 4, 5, 6 or 7 are cleanly pressed. So we end up with M2, if and only if, S4 or S5 or S6 or S7. In the logic circuit, M2 is the output of a 4-input OR gate with inputs S4, S5, S6 and S7. Continuing with the second lowest order bit, M1, we see from the table that M1 is 1 exactly when one of the keypad buttons 2, 3, 6 or 7 are cleanly pressed. So we get M1, if and only if, S2 or S3 or S6 or S7. In the logic circuit, M1 is the output of a 4-input OR gate with inputs S2, S3, S6 and S7. Finally, the lowest order bit, M0, we see from the table that M0 is 1 exactly when one of the odd-numbered keypad buttons is cleanly pressed, 1, 3, 5, 7 or 9. So M0, if and only if, S1 or S3 or S5 or S7 or S9. And in a circuit, M0 is the output of a 5-input OR gate with inputs corresponding. The remaining output is the 1-bit error signal R which is active, which has value 1, in 1,014 out of 1,024 rows of the truth table. Conversely, R has value 0 on 10 out of 1,024 rows, namely those rows described by S0, S1, S2 up to S9. So R is 1 if and only if it is not the case that one of the 10 SI signals is 1. Hence, in a circuit for the system, we can use a 10-input OR gate followed by a NOT gate to produce the output R. Given the large number of inputs, we won't try to draw the circuit diagram for the BCD encoder system. To describe these and larger size systems, and more generally to make use of electronic design automation or EDA tools in digital system design, one uses what's called a hardware description language, or such as VHDL, to develop, analyse and simulate systems. EDA tools are used to develop systems with millions of logic gates, such as the core processor in a desktop computer. The BCD encoder system gave us a clear example of dependence of outputs on intermediate signals, where those intermediate signals characterise rows of the truth table via conjunctions of inputs or negated inputs. However, this is not peculiar to the BCD encoder. What we have just seen is an instance of a general method for deriving a logic formula 
characterizing outputs when given an input-output truth table for a combinational system. So, suppose we are given an input-output truth table for an output Z depending upon inputs, call them P1, P2, up to Pn. So the truth table has 2 to the power n many rows, whichever n you have. First, we're going to look down the column for the output Z and identify each of the rows in which Z has value 1. These are all the circumstances in which Z is true, and we use these to characterise Z. Second, for each row that output Z is 1, write down a size n conjunction of inputs or negated inputs, which uniquely describes that row of the truth table. If input pi is 0 on that row, then include not pi in the conjunction, while if input pi is 1 on that row, then include the positive atom pi in the conjunction. Third step, write down the disjunction of all these row conjunctions. If output Z is 1 on M many rows, then we will have a size M disjunction. The output Z is then equivalent to this disjunction of row conjunctions, because these row conjunctions describe all and only the circumstances in which Z is true. This is a general method for deriving a logic formula characterising outputs when given an input-output truth table for a combinational system. So let's get some practice with this method straight away. Consider a three-input, one-output system with truth table as shown, giving the dependence of output Z on inputs P, Q and R. Which of these four formulas correctly describe output Z as a function of inputs P, Q and R. Remember, we start by identifying each of the rows in which Z is 1. There are three of them. OK, how did you go? The correct answer is D, as its three disjuncts exactly describe the three rows of the truth table in which Z is 1. In this and the next lesson, when we refer to rows of a truth table by number, we're going to use the decimal translation of the binary code for the input combination of the row. So for the eight-row truth table here, the rows are numbered 0, 1, 2, up to 7, with the three-bit binary codes 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on up to 1, 1, 1 for row 7, going down the table in standard order. So back to this example with the three inputs P, Q and R, row 1 with binary code 001 is described by not P and not Q and R. Row 2 in binary 010 gives not P and Q and not R. And row 3 binary 011 gives not P and Q and R. These three are all the rows and the only rows in which Z is 1, so we get that Z is true if and only if the dis disjunction of these three row conjunctions is true. The other answers, A, B and C, each have at least one of their disjuncts with an error. If you have more questions or comments, first take a look at the course notes and then head into the discussion boards, and I'll check in on the discussion there. When we apply our method to go from truth table output column to a logic formula, characterising the output in terms of the inputs, the resulting formula is always of the same shape or form. A logic formula is said to be in disjunctive normal form, or is in DNF, if and only if it is a disjunction of conjunction of literals where a literal is either an atomic proposition or the negation of an atomic proposition. As is common in an interdisciplinary subject like logic, one needs to learn differing terminology used in different disciplines for the same concepts. In the digital systems literature, a Boolean algebra expression is said to be in sum of products form when it is in DNF form, 
an oaring of N terms built out of atoms and their negations. So it is clear that for every propositional logic formula A, there exists at least one propositional logic formula B, such that B is in D and F, and A is logically equivalent to B. This is true because, in principle if not in practice, we can draw up the truth table for the given logic formula A and then proceed as we did for input-output truth tables to identify all the rows in which A is 1, form the row conjunction for each such row, and then take the disjunction. The resulting formula B is the canonical disjunctive normal form for A. In general, for a given propositional logic formula, there will be several different DNFs that are all logically equivalent. When we characterise an output as a DNF formula in terms of the inputs, the resulting logic circuit diagram will always have a standard two-level structure. At the outer level, a single OR gate with two or more inputs, and at the inner level, a row of two or more AND gates, which in turn make combinations of inputs or their negations. One of several advantages of DNF logic circuits is that they are very easy to translate into a NAND-only circuit. Using the de Morgan's law equivalences, it is easy to show that mechanically replacing every gate whether it be an AND, an OR, or a NOT, with a suitably sized NAND gate will give a logically equivalent circuit. Go back and forward. This includes replacing a NOT gate with a two-input NAND fed with two branching copies of the input. So again... So going back to the exercise, transforming from truth table to logic formula, we had three rows out of eight in, which the truth, in the truth table in which the output Z is true, with eight rows coming from the three inputs. So we ended up with a size three disjunction of size three conjunctions. So using instances of known tautologies, we can in fact simplify this canonical DNF to a much smaller DNF to conclude that Z can be characterised by the simpler formula not P and Q or not P and R. So in fact this system can be implemented using only a two-input OR gate fed by two two-input AND gates. Since each logic gate and each input takes up space, we want to minimise the size of circuit implementations, but still keep the standard form given by DNF. This leads us to the definition of a minimal DNF. A logic formula A is a minimal DNF if and only if A is in DNF and there does not exist a logic formula B such that B is in DNF B is logically equivalent to A, and B is strictly smaller than A, which would mean that either B has fewer disjuncts than A, or B had a disjunct that contained fewer conjuncts than all of A's disjuncts. Note that minimality does not imply uniqueness. There may be two or more equally small DNFs that are logically equivalent. The next and last lesson in this series on digital systems will look at how to go about finding a minimal DNF for a combinational system. For now, let's be clear about what a minimal DNF offers. Again, go back to the example system from the exercise. The DNF formula, not P and Q or not P and R, is a minimal DNF so it has a minimal DNF circuit implementation consisting of a two-input OR gate fed by two two-input AND gates. However, if we apply the tautology expressing the distribution of OR over AND, 
we can further re-express the formula as not P and Q or R, resulting in a circuit with only one AND gate and one OR gate. So yes, this circuit is smaller in gate count, but it is not in DNF form. Among other things, this non-DNF circuit cannot be readily transformed into a NAND-only circuit. So we need to be clear, our quest will be for minimal DNF circuits and not for circuits with a minimal number of gates without restriction on the form of the circuit. We return to this quest in the next lesson. We've now seen four different ways of representing a combinational digital system. A functional description, truth table, logic formula and a circuit diagram. We'll finish off this lesson by looking at a different type of combinational system and use it to illustrate these four different representations and transformations between them. A multiplexer, or MUX for short, is a system that selects between data input signals based on the value of a select control input and then feeds the signal value through to the system output. The functional description of a 2N MUX is as follows. Take as input to data input signals X and Y together with a select input signal S and produce as output the signal Z such that Z has the same value as X when the select bit S is 0 and otherwise when the select bit S is 1 Z has the same value as Y. So this 2 in MUX acts as a switch controlled by the select bit S. When S is 0, the system passes signal X through to output Z, while when S is 1, it is the other data input Y that is passed through to output Z. Overall, this is a 3 input, 1 output system. When you switch your television set between different input signals, such as your digital TV receiver, your DVD player and your desktop computer, you are in fact choosing values for select inputs in a multiplexer. The opposite of a MUX is a DMUX or demultiplexer, which takes a single data input signal and distributes it to one of several outputs, depending on the value of one or more select inputs. The truth table for our 2N MUX system is as shown. To see how we filled in the output column Z of the truth table, let's work through the meaning of the functional description. We'll break into two cases depending on the value of the select input S. The first case is when the select input S is 0 on rows 0, 2, 4 and 6 of the 8-row truth table. And remember, we're numbering from 0 to 7. In this case, according to the functional description, the bit value of the first data input X is passed through to the output Z so that we get Z is 0, 0, 1 and 1 on these four rows, the same as X. The other case is when the select input S is 1 on rows 1, 3, 5 and 7 of the 8-row truth table. In this case, again from the functional description, the bit value of the second data input Y is passed through to the output Z so that we get Z is 0, 1, 0, 1 on these four rows, the same as Y. Now that we have completed have a completed input-output truth table for the system, we can apply our method for deriving the canonical DNF formula, expressing each output in terms of the inputs. First, let's look down the column for output Z and identify each of the rows in which Z has value 1. There are four of them, rows 3, 4, 6 and 7. Step 2 Write down the row conjunctions for each of rows 3, 4, 6 and 7. So row 3 with code 0, 1, 1 gives not X and Y and S. Row 4 with code 1, 0, 0 gives X and not Y and not S. Row 6 
with code 110 gives x and y and not s, and finally row 7 with code 111 gives x and y and s. Third, take the disjunction of these four row conjunctions, and this formula characterises the output signal z, expressed using the biconditional. In the Boolean algebra and digital systems literature, row conjunctions are also called min terms or product terms because logical conjunction is the Boolean product operation. Our canonical DNF characterization of the output in terms of the inputs then gives us a recipe for constructing a DNF logic circuit for the 2-in MUX system. We have four AND gates, each with three inputs, corresponding to the four size three row conjunctions from the rows three, four, six, and seven. We have one, we now have one logic circuit design in DNF form for the two in MUX system. But the question remains, is this the smallest DNF circuit that will do the job of a two in MUX system? Can we find another DNF circuit design that has fewer logic gates and or smaller logic gates with fewer inputs. To start answering this question, let's look closely at the canonical DNF formula derived from the truth table. Using instances of known tautologies, we can derive the following sequence of logical equivalences. First, the original DNF formula can be rearranged in the order of disjuncts so that we first group together the two row conjunctions that are the same except for differing on Y versus not Y, and then group together the two row conjunctions that are the same except for differing on X versus not X. Pairs of row conjunctions that differ only on one input are called complementary. Next, we rearrange the order of the conjuncts within the row conjunctions to make clear that the first complementary pair of row conjunctions are the same on X and not S, while the second complementary pair are the same on Y and S. Finally, we can apply the tautology expressing the distribution of OR over AND followed by another tautology expressing the cancellation of subformulas of the form B or not B, and we end up with Z equivalent to the much simpler DNF form X and not S or Y and S. In the next lesson, we'll be able to see why this is a minimal DNF for the 2N MUX system, and more generally, how we can systematically exploit this idea of cancelling and simplifying complementary pairs of row conjunctions. Indeed, if we go back to the original functional description, it's easier to see the origins of this final minimal DNF for the 2N MUX system. Rephrasing that functional description, the output signal Z will be 1 exactly when either input x is 1 and not s is 1, or input y is 1 and s is 1. The resulting minimal DNF circuit has an outer level 2 input OR gate and two 2 input AND gates at the inner level. This brings us to the end of this lesson. In the next and final lesson on digital systems, we'll see a general method for finding a minimal DNF circuit for a combinational system.